Now I'll be looking at respiration, another respiration, I'll be looking at glycolysis. Now to understand this better, you should watch my video on respiration that talks about energy. And in that video, I said energy is obtained from organic food that we eat. Organic food and that the food we eat can also be referred to as organic molecule. Now, this organic molecule can also be referred to as respiratory substrate. That can be referred to as respiratory substrate. Carbonhydrate is an example of respiratory substrate. And carbonhydrate is a polysaccharide. It can undergo hydrolysis to give you disaccharides. Then disaccharides before they undergo hydrolysis to give you monosaccharides. Example of monosaccharides is glucose. Another example is galatose. Another example is fructose. Now for this, our work will be looking at glucose as an example of monosaccharides. Once your carbohydrate undergo hydrolysis and to give you monosaccharides at the end of the day, the monosaccharides is the one that enters into a respiratory pathway to allow respiration to take place. Now the second respiratory substrate I look at is the lipid. The lipid is also hydrolyzed to give you fatty acid and glycerol. And the third one is protein. Prote protein undergo hydrolysis as well to give you amino acid. And this is the amino acid undergoes the amination, which comes out in form of urine during excretion. Now, if you look at this three respiratory substrates, the lipid contains more energy than protein and starch. Why protein contains more energy than starch? Now, the concept behind this is you look at the number of oxygen carbon and hydrogen that are present in this molecule, in this respiratory substrate. And in my video, during energy, I explained that your cell can only store small quantity of ATP at a time. Your cell, a living cell, can only, can only store small quantity of ATP at a time. Meanwhile, large quantity of potential energy can be stored in carbohydrate, protein, fat, etc. Now you notice that when people are observing fasting and prayer for 3 days, 7 days or 40 days, they still survive even without eating food, though they might be taking water. So there should be a concept, a principle behind that, that people can stay for this without eating and they still survive. They still have energy to carry out one or two things. Now go and do your finding on that and get back to, to me. From there, I'm going to discuss respiratory content and what is respiratory content. Respiratory content is the ratio of volume of carbon dioxide to oxygen during respiration. The ratio of volume of carbon dioxide to oxygen during respiration under the same condition of pressure and temperature. That means the amount of carbon dioxide that is released to the amount of, compared to the amount of oxygen that is inhaled, that is taken in during respiration. The respiratory content for lipid is the lowest. You can see that on my video. For lipid is 0.7, for protein is 0.9, for carbohydrate is 1.0. Now know that this is like opposite direction of the amount of energy that can be generated from lipid, from protein, from carbohydrate. For instance, if you have 20 gram of lipid and you have 20 gram of carbohydrate, and you have 20 grams of protein. Lipid will give you more energy. Lipid contains more calorie. The lipid contains more calorie, followed by the protein, followed by the carbohydrate. But in terms of the respiratory quotient, quotient, the lipid will give you 0.7, that's the lowest, followed by protein, followed by carbohydrate. So please pay attention to that details. 
Now, when I discuss energy, I said respiration can be in two form. It can be two type. One is aerobic respiration. The second one is anaerobic. And aerobic respiration is the respiration that takes place in the presence of oxygen. It has four stages. One is glycolysis. And note that glycolysis takes place in your cytoplasm. The second stage there is link reaction, which takes place in the matrix of your mitochondria. Krebs circle also takes place in the matrix of the mitochondria. Then the last step, the last stage there, which is oxidative phosphorylation, takes place in the crystal. Now, looking at glycolysis, that is the center of our work. Now, glycolysis takes place in your cytoplasm, as I said earlier. Now, if you are writing YEC or you are writing GC or Cambridge IGC, this is okay for you. For glycolysis, you have just three main steps there. One is phosphorylation, second is lysis, and the third is oxidation. Glycolysis means glucose, which is a cis carbon compound, changes to pyruvate, which is a three carbon compound. Glucose, which is a cis carbon compound, changes to pyruvate, which is a three carbon compound. Now, the glucose, one molecule of the glucose, one molecule of glucose will give you two molecules of pyruvate. Please note that. Now, what happened in phosphorylation? Phosphorylation means that ATP, ATP here, is added to the glucose. So that process is referred as phosphorylation. And the purpose of that taking place is to activate your glucose to be able to generate ATP for you, to be able to generate ATP in your cell. So two molecules of ATP are added to glucose to give you exos bisphosphate, or you can say fructose one cis bisphosphate. You can say fructose one cis bisphosphate. Now that will undergo lysis. That means breaking down, it's splitting into two to give you two molecules of Charles phosphate. Two molecules of Charles phosphate. Some matram I also refer to as G3P. G3P means glycehydehyde 3 phosphate. Glycehydehyde 3 phosphate. So now the third step in glycolysis is oxidation. And that means electron is removed from the food molecule. That's the respiratory substrate. Electron is removed from this organic molecule. Also, hydrogen is also released from it. Hydrogen is also released from it. The electrons that are removed are added to oxidize NAD plus to give you a reduced form. The two electrons are added to NAD plus to give you a reduced form. And one hydrogen is added to it while the second hydrogen remains in solution or in that system, remain in the system. Now, at the end of the day, four molecules of ATP are generated. Four molecules of ATP are generated during glycolysis. But the net ATP generated is two because two ATP is made used while four ATP is generated. So the net ATP you have is two molecules of ATP. Writing Cambridge A level exam or foundation program, or you are writing JUPEP, or you are writing high GMB, you have to understand glycolysis beyond the level of ordinary level, beyond the ordinary level. Now you notice that I said earlier that glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm, and it is when glucose undergoes series of reaction to give you what. Pyruvate. So please note that. And only one molecule of glucose will give you two molecules of pyruvate. Remember that I said glucose undergo phosphorylation. That is the first step. Then the second step is lysis takes place. That's splitting into two. Then the third step is oxidation. That's from this point, 
down to pyruvate. Now, in phosphorylation, what happened? Your glucose receives ATP. This ATP, adenosine triphosphate, that contains three phosphate group. So once your ATP comes in contact with your glucose, your glucose will receive a phosphate group from the ATP to form glucose 6-phosphate, to form glucose 6-phosphate. The ATP has undergo hydrolysis to release, to give out one molecule of phosphate and is converted to ADP. ADP is adenosine diphosphate. That means it contains two phosphate groups. During the hydrolysis, hydrogen ion is removed as well and energy is also released. So your glucose 6-phosphate will now go isomerism to form fructose 6-phosphate. Please note that. Glucose 6-phosphate will now go isomerism to also give you fructose 6-phosphate. And you can also note the name of the enzymes that are involved in each of these steps. Now, the second ATP is added to your fructose 6-phosphate. This is your fructose 6-phosphate. The second ATP is added to it to form fructose 1-6-bisphosphate. Note that the cis in this place, that's glucose 6-phosphate, tells you that the phosphate is on the carbon number 6. So when isomerism takes place, the phosphate will still maintain its position in the fructose. Now the second phosphate group that is added shows you that the second phosphate group is added to carbon on number one. That's the first carbon in your fructose molecule. The fructose is also a cis carbon compound. Glucose is a cis carbon compound. So on your fructose here, you have one phosphate group on the first carbon. You have the second phosphate group on the cis carbon. So one molecule of glucose receives two molecules of ATP during phosphorylation. And the purpose of glucose receiving ATP, receiving the phosphate from your ATP, is to activate your glucose. Is to activate your glucose so, you have, so that your glucose can undergo needed reaction to generate pyruvate. Much more to give you ATP energy that is needed for your daily activity. Now, after generating fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, the second step is that your fructose 1,6-phosphate, which is a cis-carbon compound, will split into two to give you G3P. G3P here is known as glycerhydeide-3-phosphate. Glycerhydeide-3-phosphate is a three-carbon compound. It's a three-carbon compound. The fructose is a cis-carbon compound. When the cis-carbon compound divides into two, it gives you three-carbon compound. That means you have two carbon compound. Two, you have a, you have two molecules of G3P. G3P, I said, is a three-carbon compound. It's a compound that contains three carbons. Now, from your G3P down to pyruvate, what you have is oxidation. What you have is oxidation. Now remember that oxidation is the loss of electron. Oxidation can also be defined as the addition of the addition of oxygen or the loss of hydrogen. What we are considering here is that your G3P loses electron. That's oxidation. Your GP also loses hydrogen. Now two electrons are lost from your G3P. The two electrons are taken by your NAD+. Plus. NAD+, plus is oxidized nicotinamide dinucleotide. Oxidized nicotinamide dinucleotide. Now, the two electrons that are removed from your G3P, that's your glycerhydride 3 phosphate those electrons are added to your NAD plus to form NADH. 
hydrogen that are also released that are removed from your G3P, the hydrogen, one of the hydrogen is added to your NAD plus to form the reduced form, while the second hydrogen remains in the system, meaning the solution. So NAD plus is oxidized form, while NADH is reduced form. So note that during oxidation, the, the third step in your glycolysis, as oxidation as oxidation takes place on your G3P, your NAD plus is reduced. Now that happens for your G3P on one molecule. On the second molecule, exactly the same thing also happens. Now, while that is taking place, your G3P is an organic substrate, or you can say an organic molecule. So from your G3P, phosphorylation also takes place. That means release of phosphate group, release of phosphate group, which is added to your ADP to form ATP, added to your ADP to form ATP. Now, this ATP is known as adenosine triphosphate. The second phosphorylation also occurs here. So from one molecule of glucose, you have two molecules of pyruvate generated, four molecules of ATP generated, two molecules of NADH generated.